a seat. God bless you. Y'all are always so amazing. I love y'all. They do awesome. Amen. How many expecting tonight? Come on, give it up for everyone tonight. Amen. Because you're in the house. Amen. Come on, give Jesus a big old high five. Okay, those of you that just clapped, you didn't follow instructions. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I love y'all. It's just amazing. I just want to tell you, Ap Apostle Sloan sends his love to everyone. And he's excited to see you all. But De come on, let's just give it up for Pastor Douglas. And Ashley Douglas. Amen. Amen. Evangelist Rick Ross. Evangelist Sherry. Come on, we got the hockey family, Pastor Hockey and his beautiful wife. And we got Stephen and his beautiful wife, Bianca. Come on, stand up. They've done amazing. They're so awesome. They're so awesome. We are excited. We are excited. So I just tell you, remember, I'm not going to even do much announcements. I just want to tell you, don't forget the cafe after service. But let me tell you, please remember, receive what God has for you. Receive everything he has for you tonight because it's a brand new night. Everything that was done from this point behind us is behind you. Amen. Don't look at it. Remember, the Lord gave you a set of eyes. And you look forward. You don't look backwards. Amen. I know this woman don't look back. I look forward. If I use the back, it's because it's testimony. But other than that, I'm forward. I'm forward. I'm a focus. Right in front, in front, amen. Okay, Pastor Hockey, we're ready for you, sir. I believe that it's time, and let's go ahead and stand up for the man of God that's going to speak today, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Good evening, everybody. God is good. Are you ready for the word? Are you ready for a touch? Amen. Who knows what's going to happen tonight? The music is just so, wow. Amen. If, if I could, I'd put you all in my suitcase. And we'll travel and preach everywhere. Amen. Come on, let's give it up to the worship team. Wonder, wow, hallelujah. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Well, uh, before you sit down, put your hand on your heart. And just say, Lord, speak to me. Bring revelation, understanding, illumination of your word in Jesus' name. Say this, I declare, I do not hear the voice of a stranger, but I hear the voice of the good shepherd in Jesus' name. I have a teachable spirit, a receptive heart in Jesus' name. Say this, I bind anything that is not of you in Jesus name be glorified Lord in this meeting tonight in Jesus name we pray amen if you agree give somebody again a handshake and say I'm so glad that you made it tonight you may be seated If you're here for the first time tonight, we are just glad that you made it. Uh, we are very grateful and uh, honored and privileged to stand here and speak to you. Uh, we are from South Africa. Now, a lot of people come to us and say, do you know Brother Joe from Ghana? <laughs> and uh, no, I don't because uh, Africa is huge and there's 54 countries in the continent of Africa. So uh, when somebody say, you know, you from here, you know, it's like you guys, it's like me coming to you and saying, hey, do you know Peter from New York? You know, <laughs> it, it's the same thing. It's, uh, it's huge. So uh, Africa is big, but South Africa is right at the bottom of the continent of Africa. And uh, that's where we come from. We are born and raised there. We still live there right now. We in the in the the capital city of South Africa called Pretoria, and that's where we reside, my wife. And uh, if you haven't seen my wife when she comes in, it's in the dark, so she might want you to stand up and everybody can see my pretty wife God has given me. Yeah. Hallelujah. We were married 30 years this year. 
Amen. Thirty years. And so uh, we've been together from high school, and uh, you know the Bible says, "He who finds a wife finds a good thing." So I found my good thing. It's mine, not yours. Amen. <laughs> And uh, then she blessed me with three beautiful boys. My eldest son, Michael, who is married, he is 28 years old, and, and uh, he's been in Ari in his lifetime, so we've got three grandchildren already. Hallelujah. Yeah, three grandkids, and uh, we're very blessed to have him. He's saved, his family's saved, they're all serving God, working in the church. And then uh, Stephen and Bianca, that is here. Won't you stand up, Stephen and Bianca, and they can see you. They, they newlyweds. They got married last year. And uh, they also joined our ministry last year, working full-time, uh, don't want to say for us, but with us for God's kingdom. And I believe that we need to leave a legacy behind. So um, we're training them up. They're in the pit. Who knows what the pit is? A prophet in training, right? So they're in the pit and they're learning a lot and doing. Bianca has an awesome, awesome testimony. Uh, she comes out of the, the drug world out also, you know, and uh, has gone through a lot of things in her life. And God has radically saved her. She also died. And the Lord had, had brought her back to life as well. And um, so she's just got a powerful testimony. Maybe one day she can come and share that with you guys. And then Stephen, um, he's one of a twin. So his twin brother looks exactly just like him. The only difference is he combs his hair the other way. <laughs> That's the, how we know them apart. But they are also, he's also married. So um, Stephen and Jock, Jock is my other twin son, who, who uh, Stephen got married first in May, and then they got married in June. So after each other last year, and so they're also in the ministry uh, going full time for God. So I'm very blessed to have our kids with us. And so they're traveling with us all over the world where we go. Um, purposely, I'm having them travel with us. I want them to, I want people, you know, just like for us, we're new to you. But what I like it is that I believe this is going to be a long standing relationship. It's not just a once off. And that's what I believe it's, it's necessary to have to build relationship. And so that if I did die, that, you know, that they would be able to come and minister as well, you know, because we, we called Healing Ministries International. And so it's not Dion Hockey Ministries, it's a Healing Ministries International. And in that way, uh, it's open for my kids to go on uh, I I running the ministry. Amen. Amen. Uh, those of you who were not here last night, uh, we average, this is our 29th year full-time ministry. And uh, on the 23rd of September, uh, 1990, is when I and my wife got born again and gave our hearts to Jesus. And so three days after that, uh, my testimony is on the internet if you want to watch it. God hasn't allowed me to share that yet. But uh, three days after I got saved, I planted my first church with 400 members. After I got saved, no, no, no Bible school, no, no knowledge about anything. I just uh, started working full time for God. Three days after I got saved. And I haven't stopped since then. So we've just been preaching and, and traveling. And God has done great things. I do believe in the scripture that says in Acts chapter 1, 8. You all know it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then with this power, you'll be a witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so I believe if, they, if you want to follow an order, there's an order there. Uh, we have a saying in our country, um, we say that, that charity begins at home. Are you familiar with a saying like that? So charity begins at home. So we started preaching um, in, in our little town. The town I got saved in is a very, very small um, town. Uh, we only had 700 people living in our town. And, uh, but that's the town. But then obviously the surrounding region, there's, there's thousands of other people living there. But um, I, I, I went out and I evangelized every door, every house, not for one day or one week or one month, but for five years, we knocked on every door, inviting people to come to church. Um, every night, I've had people put knives in my throat, you know, wanting to kill me, put their dogs on me, a lot of stuff. And I, there's a lot of things I can share, but I was desperate for God to move. 
and I was desperate to see the church. We planted eight churches already, uh, and one, and this was my um, this was our second church where we were at, and preaching every night, preaching every night. You know, just um, uh, I would just go into a place and begin to knock on doors and invite them to come to church, and and that's how we did that. You know, and um, so if you think you've evangelized, let me ask you: How many doors have you knocked on in your street, and how long have you done that, and how many of them have responded? Because if you want to see revival come, it's going to take effort like that. You, you know, we give up. You say, well, I invited somebody, but they didn't come. And then you actually cheated because you invited another Christian friend to come. <laughs> and you didn't invite the lost to come. So uh, we, we need to really focus a lot more on evangelism. And you'd say, but why? Because, again, it's all about heaven and hell. There's, there's nothing, nothing else apart from heaven and hell. We're, we are granted a time span of 70, 80, or 90 years on this earth. That is not even a drop in the ocean. Because I don't think we understand the word eternity. Say that word. Say eternity. Eternity. What does that mean? It, <laughs> there's no end to the word eternity. You know, I think some people think, the science people think, you know, that they, they're going to build a spaceship and it's going to fly out in one direction and it's going to fly and fly. And then eventually one day they're going to hit the end of the universe, you know, and then, then that's the end. But I want to tell you there's no end to the universe. Because God's word does not return to him void. And when he said, let there be light, his word even now is still going out. And it's still forming stars, still forming universes. It's just going forever. You understand? That's just going to keep on going. So they'll never find the end of the universe. Or the end of whatever is out there. And what I love about this is that God, you know, the Bible says God holds the universe in the palm of his hand. Oh, what a revelation. Think about that. That for all these years when God said, let there be light, whenever he said that, uh, he's still right now, he's watching the universe grow in the palm of his hand. And then you and I have the audacity to tell him how to go about his business. Who are we? Who are we to think that we can tell God how to move? We are nothing. We are nothing. But one truth is there. God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus. That He died on the cross. And by this truth that we know, that when Jesus died on the cross, He died for all mankind. So that those who would believe on Him, call on His name, will be saved, will receive everlasting life. Do you agree with that? And that one day, all of this is going to come to an end. And there's going to be a heaven and there's going to be a hell. And our function as a church is not just to be here and encourage each other and, and, and we do that and it's good, yes, and we equip because we're called to equip the saints, right? But our, fa our function is to remember the end goal, souls. Souls. There's nothing else but souls. I like Reinhard Bonker. Reinhard Bonker said this. He said, when the rapture takes place, and Jesus comes to fetch us. He says, I'm going to grab a sinner here and I'm going to grab a sinner here. And when we fly halfway up, I'm going to turn around and say, shall I let go? Or are you going to give your hearts to Jesus? <laughs> In other words, he's going to leave fighting going for souls. Amen. We got to win souls. We got to win souls. Now, I understand that a lot of people say, yeah, but you get different churches and different flavors and different cultures and different everything. Listen, when you and I get born again, we take on one culture, and that's the Jesus culture. We don't take on any other culture. We, we don't think like the world, act like the world, become like the world. We become like Jesus Christ. That's the word Christian. The word Christian means to be Christ-like. Would you all agree? I am like Jesus. I talk like Him, walk like Him, move like Him. And if I look at the life of Jesus, I'm not talking about the church. I don't care about the church. I'm talking about the life of Jesus because I'm like Him. Jesus went about. He went about. He did not sit down. He didn't wait for somebody to come to Him. But He went about preaching, healing, delivering. Jesus was about evangelism. Yeah. 
And if I want to be like him, who's my master, my savior, my lord, my king, then I am to go and do what he's doing. That's who we are. But a lot of people just want to come to church. They don't want to get involved in going. No, that's why Jesus three times said, go. Go and make disciples. Go and preach this gospel. Go. That's the two-thirds of God's name is go. You know, go. <laughs> God. <laughs> go. So your job and my job is to go. Why? Because of souls. You know of people dying and going to go to hell. You know friends, family. You know many people. And have they heard this message about Jesus? The greatest question that was asked me 29, or, uh, yeah, 29 years ago, on the 23rd of September. Now, I grew up, I was 25 years old when I got saved. I did not go to any church. I had no knowledge of Jesus. I wasn't brought up in a religious house. We didn't have a Bible. We didn't have prayer. We had nothing, 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 nothing. So when I heard about Jesus, I was 25 years old for the first time, believe it or not. Yeah, I knew about God, you know, we knew about heaven and we knew about church, but I did not know the truth about all of this. And so when I went to that church service that first morning, I'll never forget it. When I went in there and after all the preaching, and I can share a lot about what happened that morning, but when the pastor said, bow your head and close your eyes, I did that. And then he said this, he said, I want to ask you a question. And you know, in 25 years, I'd never, ever, ever heard somebody ask me that question. And I can guarantee you that there are hundreds of thousands of people in Houston who've never heard this question. And the question was, if you died right now, where will you go? It's a revelation question. If you died right now. Now, a lot of people give a lot of answers. You know, some people say, well, if I die, we go into nothing. You know, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that. There's nothing out there. It's amazing how an atheist says he doesn't believe in God, but yet he's fighting always about God. <laughs> They're always fighting about God because they believe. They just don't want to admit it. But you wouldn't put up an argument if you didn't, you know, if you didn't believe in it. Isn't that amazing? So the greatest thing to hidden atheists is just ask them, where you are going when you die? And then you can, you know, but some people say, well, if I die, you know, I'm hoping I'm going to heaven. Hoping is not knowing you're going to go to hell. Well, I go to church. So what? So does the devil. The devil sits in church every Sunday. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> so we, <laughs> uh, help me, Lord. People say, I, I think I'm going to heaven. Same thing, thinking is not knowing. You're going to go straight to hell. There's some people just, you know, they just sit in church because they were taught to go to church. My mother went to church and my mother's mother went to church, so I go to church. What are you doing here? I don't know. I'm just, I know I'm supposed to be here. So we need to bring this truth across. Why am I sharing all of this? I want you to go with me to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to get mad or glad again tonight, but something's going to happen to you. Mad or glad. I think if I had to die before the Lord would come, on my gravestone, my wife's going to put there that says, yeah, lies a man who made the devil mad and Jesus glad. <laughs> Amen. We've come to torment the devil. Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to read verse 13, and, I, and I, I hope you'll get this message with me tonight, because I got a revelation when I read the scripture. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, now listen to this, he's asking his disciples, I gather that most of you sitting here, hopefully all of you are disciples of the Lord, right? Yeah. We know the word disciple means a follower of Jesus. So Jesus now asks a general question to all the disciples. So you know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? So tonight, if I may put it like this, Jesus is standing here. And he's asking you a question. He says this. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In other words... 
Who do the, what do the people think of me? Who do, they, who do they think I am? Well, they answered and they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. So he's getting a general answer. Who do you say is Jesus? Oh, he loves us. Who do you say is Jesus? Oh, he's our healer. Who do you say is Jesus? Oh, man, he's just, you know, he's our provider. You know, we get these different kinds of answers in church. But now Jesus gets a little bit more personal. And I like this. So he says to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you think I am? What do you say? Now, what I like about the scripture is only one guy gives an answer. Only one. The others didn't answer. Who's the one? Peter. You know, old crazy Peter, the evangelist, the, the bold one. The, he always puts his, his foot in it. You know, he, he, he's quick. He, he's one of those who are quick to speak and slow to hear. You know, I, I'm like Peter many times. Peter answered and said to him the following. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So his answer, he didn't say you're a prophet. He didn't say you're somebody who can just do miracles and signs and provide. He gives a different answer. He says, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus got so radically excited about this that he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not, or the gates of Hades, shall not prevail against it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, I've read this thing many, many times. But what I love about what Jesus says to him, the first thing he says, you're blessed. Because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Now, what I have noticed through the years of my ministry and going into the hundreds of thousands of places that I've been, the churches are packed with many, 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 many people who are not born again. There are many people sitting in church for years. For years. And they are living on somebody else's testimony. And they are going on hearsay according to what other people say. But they themselves have never had a personal encounter, a revelation. I want to use this word, a revelation of who Jesus Christ is. I believe in Jesus Christ because you said so. I believe in Jesus Christ because, yes, we read the Bible and you, you saying, I need to believe the Bible. So, okay, I believe the Bible. And yes, okay, I believe in Jesus. But you know what? People who speak like that have never had a personal encounter, a revelation of who Jesus is. Now, why do I, do I say this? I get very excited about this. Because Jesus knew something. That once you have a revelation of who he is, Jesus said this. On this revelation, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, once you have had an encounter, a revelation, Pastor Cindy, you know what I'm talking about because I heard your testimony last night. Once you have a revelation of who Jesus is, nobody can shut you up. You will tell the whole world. You will get out there. You will evangelize. You will be first in church and last to leave. You will be there in every worship service, every prayer meeting. It doesn't matter who, what, where, or when. I am there because I've had a revelation. I've had an encounter. You don't have to beg me, pay me, or ask me to come. I'll just do it. I'm out there hungry for Jesus Christ. That's what a revelation does. That's what a revelation does of Jesus. And Jesus said, Peter, 
Because you have this revelation, flesh and blood. You know, we, we would sit and not just me, but the, what do we do as leaders, as pastors? We encourage the church, please get out there, evangelize. Please join a home cell. Please get involved in the prayer group. Please serve. Just please. Why must we ask you to please do something? If you had a revelation, we don't have to beg you. We don't have to ask you. We don't have to cry out and pay you money. You just do it because you've had a a revelation of who Jesus is. How many people are sitting in church who've never had an encounter? And I'm, you know, I, an encounter with God is not coming to the front and the pastor prays for you. And because everybody falls down, you, you, you pull out the courtesy fall. Who knows what's the courtesy fall? Well, everybody's falling, so I'll just fall with them. We need a revelation. Are you understanding this? We need a revelation. We sing songs, more of you, Jesus. We were, and it's great songs, and I believe in these songs because it's true. We need more of you. But how many people just sing it, but it's not from here? Because a revelation of Jesus will bring me back to that point that I spoke about last night, prayer. When you seek him until you find him, you seek him, you pray, you push in, you get in the word, you'll study the word. You know, when I got saved, I would read my Bible right through the night, what not one, many times. And I would read the scripture and the words would just jump out and it would just be like, goodness me, I never knew this. And I would just read and read and then I said, the sun's up. I didn't even feel tired. I said, Lord, this is, I got to go to work now. Oh, I would just begin to pray and pray and pray. And, you know, it was just be, it was just be like waves of energy and power. And, and, you know, if we say that the Lord appeared to us, you know, so I, I, I would tell you some stories that people just say, mm -mm, I can't believe that. But I tell you what, I've seen Jesus come to me three or four times in my life. I've heard him speak to me not once, but many times in an audible voice. I have shaken under the power and the glory of God for over three, four hours. You know, I tell you what, man, God is real. He's as real as I. I am real standing here in front of you. People who, who criticize and mock and say stuff and say, oh, that's not for me. Or I don't believe in that friend. You've never had an encounter with him. You've never had an encounter. And if you haven't had an encounter, then you've got to make a deal, a, a decision. You've got to say, Lord, I'm going to lock myself in the bedroom. And I'm going to stay there until you and I have an encounter with each other. And I tell you, when you walk out of that room and you've had an encounter with him, then I don't have to beg you to go knock on doors. I don't have to ask you to please try and bring somebody to church. You will just be like a machine going off. You'll just do it for Jesus. So tonight, guess what I'm going to lay hands on you for? I'm going to lay the ha my hands on you. I'm going to ask God, God, let each and every one have a fresh revelation of who you are. Not a religious revelation, not a hearsay revelation of what somebody encountered or what somebody else is doing, but that you will have a first-hand encounter that you can be like Peter and go out there and begin to change the world. Are you with me? Peter, Jesus was so excited. He said, Peter. From now on, I'm changing your name. You're going to be Simon Barjona. Or oh, that's his surname. He said, but I'm, I'm, I'm anointing you with my power. Are you saying, upon this rock, upon this revelation, I will build my church. And guess what? The gates of hell will not stop you. Satan cannot stop you. And I can tell you many stories of the countries we've been in. How Satan has tried to kill me. Not once, not twice, many times. Many times. And that's every time the devil tried to kill me, it's like he's running into a wall. Just he cannot get to me. This is what revelation can do. But what I like about this even more, he says the following, and I will give you, listen, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. When do you receive the keys of the kingdom of heaven? When you have a revelation. See, you can go to Bible college and you can study for seven years and you can have 500 degrees. I don't care. If you haven't had a revelation, it means nothing. 
You can go to deliverance classes and you can go to demonology school and you can go to healing school and you can go to whatever school. But if you've never cast the devil out, if you've never laid your hands on somebody, if you've never ministered to somebody, all that is just head knowledge. And head knowledge puffs up and brings pride. Are you with me? Who wants revival? Would you like that tonight if I prayed and said, Lord, may we have a revelation of who you are. A revela- yeah, maybe in church, maybe tonight, you know, you fall out truly and God touches you and you do have an encounter and you have that visitation. Wonderful. But what I would love more even than that is that you would go home and when you would say, I'm making a decision to turn off my TV and Lord, I'm going to kneel by my bed tonight and I'm going to pray. And I don't care if I have to pray right through the night, but I'm going to pray, Lord, until you and I have a visitation together. Because in here, we can, we can, we can put up that, uh, a show. We can look good. We can sound good. But it's not what impresses me here, what happens to you. It's what impresses me out there, what happens to you. Are you with me? I mean, I'm so, you know, I've seen it so many times. I pray for people, and when I pray, you know, and they're lying on the floor, and they watch me when I come by them. <laughs> and when I do that... I'm sorry, that's who I am. You know, I just, I, I'm, I spoke about tradition, and this is the tradition that has, been, that has been manifesting in the churches of today. We have a lot of false manifestations and a lot of false showmanship and a lot of gimmicks going on, yet the true encounter is not there. I'm asking the Lord, Lord, let us, me too. Lord, give us a fresh revelation of who you are. Lord, that I may know you as Paul said. Lord, that I can get out there and do the work that you have called me to do. That I would be obedient to your word, Father God. And Jesus, you died on that cross and you were beat bitterly bad and you were ripped apart and tortured, Lord. But you did that out of love. Lord, let me experience your love to go out there and tell those people that Jesus, you love them as well. Amen. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now watch this one. When you have a revelation, the keys will be given to you. I really believe this. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Listen, there's many people who pray and bind, but they never see the results. Never. Many people try to cast the devils. They can't do that. Why? They don't have the key. They don't have the revelation. They don't have the true anointing and authority. Hmm. Are you still okay? So he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, I want you to go with me to John chapter 3. I want to speak to you about having this revelation. John chapter 3. The devil's a liar. You've heard this, I'm sure, a million times. But again, Revelation. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Say with me, Nicodemus. Nicodemus. What was he? A Pharisee. Now, the first thing that we in our Pentecostal religiousness think is, ha, he's a bad guy. It's the first thing we think. (laughs) Tradition. You know, but, but let me tell you this about Nicodemus. Number one, he wasn't stupid. He was a learned man. Number two, he feared God in his way as the Jewish tradition taught. He feared Jehovah. Listen to what I'm saying. He feared God more than I think a lot of us fear God. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not knocking. I'm just, I want us to try and see the other side of the picture. He was a man who went down to the T. He followed the law out of his respect and fear, his adoration for God the Father. Yes, they did the bad things. Yes, they, they, but in general, he did have a God-fearing relationship with Jehovah. Would you agree with that? So this man who feared the Lord God the Father, He comes to Jesus by night and he says to Jesus the following. Number one, he says, Rabbi, 
or, or, or how do you say, rabbi? Yeah. Rabbi. So the first thing Nicodemus does, listen to this, he acknowledges Jesus to be also a teacher. He acknowledges this. Why? Because Jesus grew up in the same traditions that Nicodemus grew up. Would you all agree? Yeah. Jesus had the same schooling that Nicodemus had. Yeah. They came through the same traditions, the same upbringing, the same everything. Right? So he says to him, teacher. But now he says the following. We know that you're a teacher come from God. But now he says something. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus is highly confused because he's, he's thinking to himself, hang on now. Yes, Jesus. He grew up the way I grew up. He studied the law as I studied the law. He knows the Torah as I know the Torah. You know, his mom and dad brought him up in all the Jewish traditions. We're the same. But, but, but what, what I don't get about, about you, Jesus, is you're different than I am. You're doing something that I can't do. You, you, obviously, God is with you because no one can do these miracles, these signs, these healings. That, that is flowing through you. But uh, what makes you different than me? You see, Nicodemus was truly seeking after the truth. He was really hungering to know what did Jesus have that I don't have. Why do we have so many people coming to church... Wanting to see the power of God. <laughs> because you see something in the guy who's preaching here, something that you desire and want, but you don't have it. Come on, come on. Don't hurt. Right. Come on. I hope I'm bringing this across right. Not, yeah. not judging, not criticizing, just thinking. Lord, why? Yes, the question. Why are the churches not growing? Why is our church not growing? Why is every church just got the same group of people, the same amount of years? And there's, yes, there's, there's times when the Spirit of God comes and He moves. Yes, there's times of refreshing, Acts chapter 3. There's a time when God comes and visits us, and, but yet the church just stays in the same old, same old position, place. You'll find fresh people come in, then other people go, but it just stays the same. Are you getting this? Yes. The, it's questions like this that make me concerned. Why are we not seeing the genuine truth growth, that we, the church growth, as we should be seeing? Wow. Now, hopefully you're not like, like an old lady in the church that I went to when I walked in the church. You know, it was a small little church I preached in. And I walked into this church and this old lady came and she shook my hand and she said, Oh, welcome, welcome, brother. Uh, she said, are, are you the one preaching this morning? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She said, oh, I, let, me tell you about, let me tell you about our church. We're such a loving church. Oh, we're not a very big church, she says. We're just a handful of people, but boy, do we love each other. Oh, boy, we, we're so full of God's presence. She says, I really hope, and she holds my hand, you know. She says, I really hope that we're not going to get any bigger because we are so happy with the way that we are. Well, she spoke to the wrong man. <laughs> but this is, this is the mentality of many people. Well, I'm happy in a small church. I'm happy with what we have. Why, why do we want to rock the boat and do stuff, you know, and, and just become a number? Have you ever heard that? We just become a number. We get lost in the crowd. Why? Why? What's the matter with you? Why do you want to just stay small if you can understand how many thousands and billions of people are going to hell that's going to burn in the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and they will never ever come out. What is true love? My true love is what Jesus had that drove him to the cross. And if Jesus was driven to the cross because of the act of love, how much more should you and I not be driven by love to go and tell those people whom our Savior suffered and died for?
we need to have a fresh revelation, not only of Jesus, but of the compassion of Jesus. I'm not talking about grace only. A lot of people on the grace thing, you know. And I believe in grace, don't misunderstand me. But I'm talking about that, that compassion. Matthew chapter 9 says, when Jesus was walking about the, the cities, the Bible says he was walking about teaching, number one, preaching, number two, and number three, healing the sick. Amen. And then the Bible says, and he looked around and he saw the people who were weary and scattered and having no shepherd. And the Bible says he was moved with compassion for them. It's the compassion that drove Jesus. It's the love that drove him. And this is what we need, a revelation of Jesus, his compassion, and then the power and the anointing he's given us to get out there and get the job done. Amen. This is what we need. We need the tools to get the job done. Amen. But a lot of people have so much tools in them that they can't get the job done. Let me not get into this whole teaching because I have a teaching on that. But let me remind you, here's little David. Who remembers King David? Shepherd boy. What does the Bible speak about David? Well, the first thing he did was he was taking care of the sheep. He was a shepherd. Number two, when the bear came, he didn't have swords and spears and shields. But he had God behind him. And the Bible says he killed the bear. And then the lion came. And we know what happened. The lion came to get, the, get the, the, the sheep. And so what did he do? He killed the lion. Do you remember that? He didn't have a spear, the armor, she, uh, you know, shield, all of that stuff. He was a shepherd. Yet he took out the bear and the lion. So now this battle comes. And his brothers go to war. But he was a little bit young. So his daddy didn't want him to go to war. So he put him there to take care of the sheep. I remember, who remembers the story? This is now about Goliath. Now, if you go and read this in 1 Samuel chapter 17, I believe it is, when Daniel, uh, Daniel when David went there, um, or, or this is the story, and I'm not going to read it because of the time, but the, here is Israel, and here is the Philistines. And when you study this word, you'll see that every day the two armies gathered together. There wasn't a battle, but there was a heck of a lot of shouting going on. I almost said the wrong word there. <laughs> but if, you will, if you'll notice that they got up and they shouted, ah, ah, and then Goliath would come out. He says, I'll challenge anyone who will fight me. And all the, you know, the army's going, wah, 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 you know, but they're all too scared to get out there and face him. Come on. Think about this. They had on their armor, they had on their clothes, you know, their swords were shining in the sun and, and they were screaming and, oh, we're going to get him, oh, we're going to get him, oh, kill him, kill him, you go, you go, mm -mm, no, you go, you go, no, oh, we just shout. I'm doing this purposely because this is the church exactly where we are right now. We can just come together and shout, make a big fat noise in the church. But when it comes to winning the souls, what have you done for God's kingdom? How many Goliaths have you slain? How many people have you brought to Jesus Christ? But when you come to church, we make a noise. So now what happens is, is Jesse was David's dad, right? He calls him from the field. He says, listen, your brothers are hungry. Go and take them some food. So he goes, you know, in all innocence, and he takes the food, and he goes, and he gets there. And he sees, he has the army of Israel, King Saul, and everybody, and they're standing on the mountain going, wah, 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 making a noise. And he, he, he kind of gives them, the brothers, the food. And I can imagine the brothers. I mean, they just, you know, they all. I mean, we're in a fighting mode, brother. And so David comes. He's just got his, you know, his little, what do you call this thing? A dress or a tunic or whatever. And he comes there and he just looks at this. And so he kind of like, he peeks over and he sees Goliath coming down. And all of a sudden, the army of Israel gets kind of quiet, you know. And Goliath stands up and says, who will dare to fight me? Who will attack me? And it's like, oh, David, you know, <laughs> this young guy. He, 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 hey, come on. Go and fight. Why are you going to fight? 
and the brothers get angry at him. So, hey, what do you, what do you know about warfare? Keep quiet, man. You didn't, you're not trained like I am? You don't have the knowledge I have? You don't know how to swing the sword? You don't know how to dress? You know nothing. You, you, all you do is take care of the sheep. Keep quiet, you arrogant little man, full of pride. You just come here to make trouble. That's all you're doing. And old David's standing and saying, what did I do wrong? I'm just asking who's going to get out there and fight this man. See, this, I don't know if you're hearing me, because there's a lot of people, we, we talk a lot of stuff, we preach, uh, you know, week after week, the pastors preach, everybody preaches, we go to seminars, we go to, you know, to, uh, 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 what do you call it, these uh, conferences, we, we get this tremendous teaching, and we get books, and we get papers, and we get everything, and we all go home, and we say, woo, how, oh, man, that was great, and yet, with all of that knowledge, and all of that trailing, you still haven't won a soul for Jesus. You haven't got out there and faced Goliath. Come on, somebody. We want revival. Why do we want revival? So that I can be blessed, fall on the ground and say, woohoo, what a time I had. Or do we get blessed, filled with the anointing like the upper room? We get a power, we get out there, and we use what God has given us in here. That's why we want revival. That this, this church should not be empty. It should be packed out. All these beautiful chairs, what are they? Oh, no, brother, the angels are here. Pfft, come on, get out of here. I don't want angels here. I want people here. Angels don't need to repent and go to heaven. We need to repent and go to heaven. Come on, son. We need to tell people about Jesus. We're not, we're not religious. Oh, the angels are here. Everybody knows the angels are here. Are you getting that? Well, what about the, the real deal? Getting out there, paying the price, facing Goliath. Can you imagine? Oh, David just looked at this man, you know, and uh, he said, isn't there anybody who will go and attack this uncircumcised Philistine? Well, come on, don't you have guts? Don't you have the, 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 uh, the boldness to get out there? And so all the brothers are getting angry at him. That's why people get mad at him when I preach the way I preach. Who are you to tell me what to do? Are you, you come to stir now and make trouble. We, we doing our thing. We, we busy with God. Are you? What are you busy with? I'm talking about the body of Christ as well now. You follow the, the church. So King, the, King Saul, he hears this thing. He says, oh, huh. he calls David. He says, what? You, you're a big mouth. You think you can handle that guy? He said, sure. You know the price, you know, he's gonna, you're going to get the king's daughter, you're going to get this, you're going to get that. He said, I, I'm not interested in that. What I, who's this man to come and defile our God? Why, why is the church become so quiet against people preaching on homosexuality and they get mad? Talking about abortion and we get mad, you know. Uh, 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 you know, if you speak about abortion or homosexuality, then, then you, oh, wow, shh. Slow down, brother. Slow down. Don't, don't go that way. Let's ignore the subject. Let's preach on the love of Jesus, but let's not get into the truth of the matter here. Are you getting what I'm saying? But here's the devil right now in the world, and he's defiling our God who's given us the written word, who says that abortion is wrong. Come on. Homosexuality is wrong. Stuff is wrong. It's written in the word. And yet we cower away. And we say, no, 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 no. I'm not going to get involved in that argument. This is what's happening to the church, the body of Christ in South Africa, in America, Australia, and right across the world. Because the greatest persecution the church is getting right now, I'm talking about the Western culture church, is from the gay and lesbian community. That's the greatest persecution we're going through. We are terrified of them. Why? It's operated by the devil. Oh, boy. Yeah. Pastor Cindy, you have my number. You can bail me out of jail later on. <laughs> but you understand what I'm saying? We're so afraid to get out there and knock on doors and invite people. And if we do, well, I tried it, brother. It didn't work. Why? You tried it once and they spat in your face and said, leave me alone. I have my own church. You just gave up. You just went like a dog fell on his back and surrendered. 
You didn't get out there and go and face him 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 until he gets so mad at you and says, All right, I'll come to church. Leave me alone. Come on, that's how I built my first church. I, I got so in the faces of people, I just I went over and over and over. And you know, the Lord taught us that. He told us when you pray, you know, God, he, told, he spoke about the man asking for bread. Just kept knocking on the door. Just kept knocking. Just kept knocking. Just kept knocking. Just kept knocking. Until they got so fed up, they said, okay, I'll give to you. See, we're playing church. We, we, we look good, but we're really not there where we should be. Yes, we have the, the knowledge. Yes, we have the anointing. Yes, we have the preachers, the pastors. But how much more do you want to be prophesied over? How much more do you want to have hands laid on you? You've got 10,000 people who've laid hands on you. What does that help you if you didn't win one soul for Jesus? Didn't help. This church should be full by tomorrow night. It's supposed to be. 30 years ago, it would have been full. 30 years ago, we would have had many people coming to church. They were just, but now we're sitting with the devilish things, cell phones, internet, movies, m malls. You know, the, the entertainment world has become so great. And everybody runs to go and look at the X-Men and Marvel and, you know, uh, all of these, these superheroes. But the hero that we truly have who is alive, who can do everything and more than the X-Men, he's Jesus Christ. Come on, he's here. But we don't, we, the church won't believe in that anymore. So King Saul says to David, come here. I see you, you're a very big mouth. So let me now, let me, let me, let me clothe you. Because you can't go fighting like that. That guy's big, he's going to kill you. Put on my armor. Oh, David, you know, he's never, he wasn't, he's just the shepherd boy, you know, killed the bear, killed the lions, got his stick, he's got his sling, you know, he's got his staff. And so he puts on the armor. <laughs> wow, it's kind of heavy. Picks up this big sword. Mm, I can't, I, he puts on all the, the stuff and he takes the shield and he says, all right, walk, go and fight. And he tries to walk. He can't even walk. It's just, uh, it's too heavy. You want me to fight? I can't walk. And this is what's happening in the church. We have so much head knowledge. We are so trained. We are so over empowered. We have so much stuff that we are just sitting in church, shining with the glory of the armor. But we're not getting out there facing. You know what we need to do? We need to be like David. Get rid of some of the stuff. Throw off all of that weight that you have. Throw all of that, that armor that you got, you know. When I die and I go to heaven, let, let, let me tell you. When I go to heaven, I do not want to walk in all sparkly and clean. I want to walk in with a helmet that's dented, a sword full of blood, a shield that's got guts lying all over it. Come on. I want to walk in there, and when I walk in, my God's going to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. But some people want to walk into heaven like this. I'm a soldier for Jesus. Amen. When I was in the world, I was a gangster and a fighter. I fought people. I stabbed people with knives. I've been stabbed, broke my nose, my arm, my leg. I know all about fighting. Amen. Then Jesus came and, and uh, no, sorry, in, in school I was in the gangs and all of that. Then I joined the physical army in our country and I was fighting in the war. And I was taught to fight. And now I become a child of God and now I'm a fighter for Jesus. Amen. I'm a fighter for Jesus. That's why God gave me a good name. You know that my name, Dion, D-E-O-N, comes from Gideon. You know Gideon? How do you spell Gideon? G-I-D-E-O-N. So my name is G-I Dion. <laughs> Hallelujah. I asked the Lord, why did he save me like he did? And he just said, keep on going on. Don't worry about that. We're going to fight for Jesus. Amen. Amen. So he put on all the stuff. He couldn't fight. And so the, the church of today has got so much information. And we try to be so theologically correct that we become earthly stupid. 
Are you getting what I'm saying? Yes. Well, you can't cast out devils because you've got 10 steps of doing that. And if you don't follow these steps, you're not going to be able to do it. You can't win souls if you don't follow this, that, that, and that, and that. And we be, listen, church is about human beings. It's not a job. It's not a, you know, it's not some. We're working with people. And people is relationship. And so if, you, if I love my neighbor, it's a, it's a relationship that I build. But we become so holy that we won't go into the highways and the byways anymore. I'm not going to go into the pub. What do you want me to go in the pub for? I got saved and delivered from the pub. Now you want me to go back in there? I'm not going to go there. Yeah, Jesus was with them. Doesn't say you have to drink and get drunk with them. No compromise, not even a beer, drink a Coke. And they'll say, why are you drinking a Coke? And then, wow, there's the open door. I'll tell you why. Are you getting this? So, Nicodemus, who was a man in church, Think about this. This is my revelation. He was a man in church who feared God, but he saw something in Jesus that he didn't have. And Jesus gave him the answer, and he said to him, Nicodemus, let me tell you what's your problem. Number one, you're not born again. You're not born again, for unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So a lot of people are sitting in church, but they're not born again. They're churchgoers. And they go on here saying what somebody else has experienced, but they've never had that encounter, that revelation, that born again experience. And to be born again, to see the kingdom of heaven, well, we teach this, you, you go to heaven, right? We're going to see heaven when we get born again. But you cannot have a revelation of Jesus if you're not born again to experience him here on earth right now. You must be born again. Number two, he said you must be born of water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Enter. We know that. You must, be, you must be born again to go to heaven, to enter into heaven. But you must be born again to be able to participate and do the thing of God down here on earth. We don't have to wait 20 years, you know, when I die and then I'm going to enjoy the fullness of God in heaven. No, you can have him right here, right now. For the kingdom of God is inside of us. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Yes. We can experience the fullness of Jesus right here, right now. Amen. And when we get to Matthew chapter 28 and Mark chapter 16, which I know you're very familiar with because this, this is an on-fire church, right? Who believes in the gifts. and you are, I know that. I know you do. But think about this. Matthew 28 and Mark chapter 16 was not written for certain people. It was written for all believers. When I preached in the Baptist church, I, and I've preached in, in quite a few, and, and I preached in the Dutch Reformed or the Methodist or the Lutheran, I've preached in all of these churches. And you know what I love doing? When I walk in sometimes when it's a real traditional church, there would be a member sitting there, you know, just a congregation. I say, have you been a member of this church a long time? They say, oh, yeah, I have. I say, may I see your Bible? And the guy would give me his Bible. I say, can I preach out of your Bible tonight? He says, what? Would you mind? I said, you can hold mine. Can I read your Bible? Because many times people think that their Bible is right and ours is wrong. <laughs> he says some wisdom there. And he says, sure. And then I take his Bible, and, you know, and then I just begin to read scriptures. And now I would use scriptures like, you know, go therefore and make the sign. He didn't say he was anointed, who's appointed and who's called, who has a special ad ad anointing, you know, who Jesus appeared to you and your hands are written on the wall and angels came to you, you know. He just said this, if you believe, go and do it. Amen. He didn't say if you're in the Pentecostal church or the Methodist church or the Presbyterian church. He didn't say any of that. All he said was commandment to his disciples, go, go, go. When, King, when, when David saw the, the, the Philistine, you know what he did? He went there and he said, I don't need all of this stuff on me. I have one thing. That's the name of my God. If God be for me, who can be against me? 
If God is on my side, what can stop me? This is the pro You're not hearing me. I can go and knock on doors and I don't care who throws what at me. I'm going to just keep on going because behind me is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, angels in the whole of heaven. He's backing me up. I'll go and knock on doors. I'll invite people. I'll tell people. And I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be concerned because God will protect me. And David knew that. And he said, I don't care how big this Philistine is in front of me. I don't care what. I have God on my side side and the reason why a lot of you are not evangelizing is because you're afraid what will people say what will people think of me what's going to happen if I go through rejection they're not rejecting you they're rejecting Jesus but I just got to get in there and tell the people tell the people yeah but they're going to fire me I can speak about that then use wisdom Use your lunch hour time. Use your break time. Use your coffee time. Ask the Lord to open up the door. Make a way for you to witness. How can I get to these people? Ask the Lord to open your eyes so that the gifts of the Spirit can flow through you. Somebody sitting, holding the head, holding the back. You can go up to them and pray for them and talk to them in the private time capacity. You won't be fired, but yet you'll still be able to witness to them. Is this helping anybody? Nicodemus, you must be born again. I don't know. Maybe we have Nicodemuses in church tonight. You've been in church all your life. You grew up. You know the, you know the scriptures. I want to say the Torah, but you know, for us, we know the scriptures. You can quote it left, right, and center. But yet you still haven't operated in the supernatural power of God. You don't have that authority because you haven't had that revelation. I hope my message is coming through. Because the, the purpose of tonight's message is let us not be Nicodemuses. And you know what? Nicodemus got saved. How do I know that? Because he was the only one. Well, him and another guy went and they got Jesus' body out of the grave. He went to go and get Jesus and bury him. Another guy, Paul, Saul. Remember Saul, the Pharisee, like Nicodemus? I mean, he was just so against everything, had all the knowledge. And then you know what happens to Saul? He, on his way to Damascus, God saves him. He has this encounter with God. And you know what he does when he comes back to his church? He says to them, listen, guys, I have got nothing new to tell you today, but I've discovered something new. He threw off all that religion. He threw off all that armor and all of that junk, and he began to preach on Jesus. Amen. Isn't that a revelation? Amen. And we're not a traditional church, but I do believe that we do have Nicodemuses in churches like this. All across the world. We can do the little charismatic dances and clapping and stuff, but out there. We are undercover agents for Jesus. We are 007s. We are submarine Christians. Who knows what's a submarine Christian? Huh? When you go under the water and it's quiet and you come up Sunday morning, boop, hello, how are you? Glory to God. And then boop, Monday gone, Tuesday when nobody knows you're a Christian. Nobody knows that you, you love the Lord. I was in America, we had a five week revival in Kingsville. And a lady came to me in the third week of revival. She said to me, Brother Dion, rejoice with me, rejoice with me. I said, What's happening? She said, I invited my friend who works with me at, church, uh, at my workplace. She is coming to church tonight. I said, That's great. Tell me what happened. She says, Well, you know, um, We've been working together for 10 years in the same office. We sit literally right across each other for 10 years. I said, yeah. She said, and I was listening to you preach, and I, and I've, and I've, you know, I, I, I got this boldness. You know, you have a boldness that's come upon me. And so I got this boldness, and I said to my friend, I said, listen, we have this man from Africa preaching in our church, you know, and, and uh, he's, he, he's quite a good preacher, and you've got to come and listen and hear what he has to say. I want to invite you. And so a friend says, are you a Christian? She says, yes, I am. And her friend says, so am I. But they've been working together 10 years in the same office. That's the undercover agents for Jesus, you know. 
They'll go to the pub and drink and smoke and party and barbecue and they'll dance and they'll, they'll do all of the worldly stuff as long as the people don't know who I am. As long as they don't know who I am. Isn't that sad? I'm preaching tonight. Am I preaching or teaching? I don't know what I'm doing. But I want to read this thing, and the Lord has laid this on my heart. And um, I want to speak about Peter. I'm just going as the Spirit leads me now. Is that okay? Somebody say repentance. Repentance. You know that when we become children of God, we need to repent. And when we repent, there has to be fruits. Now, in uh, how long have I been going now for? Am I still all right? I know that apostle preaches two and a half hours, so I can go for it. <laughs> but I, I want to show you something. In um, Matthew chapter 26, let's go there quickly. So here's Peter. Peter has a revelation. Who do the people say that I am? Peter says, Jesus, you are the son of the living God. Jesus said, yes, Peter, because of this revelation, I'm going to build my church. Would you agree? Upon this revelation, I'm going to, you, are, you are Peter the rock. That's the word rock, revelation, Jesus, the church. I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Would you agree? So we do have people who come to church and have a revelation. But now something happens in their lives. They backslide. Because when you truly have a revelation, you go out there and you do everything for God as much as you can. But in some time of your life, you begin to grow cold. And that, thus the word revival. We need to be revived. We need to come back to that first love, that first dedication, the promises we made to God. We need to get back there. Would you agree? <clears throat> so there's something called backsliding. Now... Yes, Peter follows Jesus, sees Jesus do signs, wonders, and miracles. Would you all agree? Yeah. Raising the dead, healing the sick. I mean, it's just miracle upon miracle. Peter sees that every day of his life. Now Jesus gets captured. And Jesus is in big trouble. I mean, it's not the, it's not the comfort zone of being in church. Now they're outside of the church. It's not in the comfort zone of being in the presence of the, of, the, of, of the disciples. Are you following me? He's not in the presence now. Jesus has been removed from him. He's standing man alone when Jesus was captured. Are you with me? Then Jesus, watch this, verse 31. Before he was captured, they're in the garden. Jesus says to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written... I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. I'm reading Matthew 26 from verse 31. But after I had been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Now Peter, yes, the man who had the revelation, Peter says to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter had a revelation of who Jesus is. Now he says to Jesus, I'm never going to deny you. Jesus turns around and says, before this night's over, you're going to deny me three times. So watch Peter's response. <laughs> I like this. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Now, this is where we stop because we think, okay, now this is just Peter and his big mouth again. But look at the next sentence. And so said all the disciples. This time, all the disciples are with Peter now. So they all said, we'll die. We'll die for you. We don't care. Jesus just said, Peter, you'll deny me. But I promise you that word was for all the others as well. Because they all said it. And so guess what happens? <clears throat> Are you still with me? Verse 69. Somebody say, somebody say backsliding. Now let me give you a quick crash course on how this backsliding thing works and why we need revival. Verse 69, I said. It says the following. Now Peter 
sat outside in the courtyard. Now remember, he's separated from Jesus. He's on his own. He's in the marketplace now. You see, tomorrow morning, you're all going to the marketplace. <clears throat> Jesus, I mean, Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. Now look what he does. He denied it before them all and he said, I do not know what you're saying. The first denial, I don't know what you're saying. I, I, no, no, you, you, you got the wrong guy here. And when he had gone out, so he separates him because he knows he's in trouble now. And so he goes out to the gateway and another girl sees him and said to those who were with him, they, with him, they said, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. Now watch progression in sin and backsliding. But again, he denied it, but not just denied it, this time with an oath. He denied it and they said this, watch, I do not know the man. How do we deny Jesus before the world out there? Maybe we don't with our lips say, I don't know the man. But we will compromise with the world and deny his word. We will deny his word by not doing what his word tells us to do. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the living God, the Holy Spirit? And that you are to take care of this body, not defile it. A, a little example, I'm sorry, I'm not knocking that. I was an alcoholic. I drank two bottles of brandy a day. I smoked 40 cigarettes a day. 40 a day. And I did all the other stuff. But I tell you what, when Jesus delivered me from that lifestyle, gambling, whoring around, all of this stuff, when he delivered me from this lifestyle, do you think I'm going to go back and begin to participate of that which he delivered me from just to be, uh, uh, just to be, friendly and, and show somebody hey i'm not you know i'm not like that like those christians you know those christians are ridiculous though they take things too far they too holy they too righteous they too they too much i'm not like that listen i'll have a smoke with you i'll have a beer with you when you do that friend you've just denied jesus christ you've just denied him in front of all of them <laughs> I can see some of you saying it's going to be a long week, brother. It's going to be a long week. But what does this do? It's producing holiness in us again. It's just, um, you know, saying, Lord, I, I need to get real with you. I can't be in this backslidden state. I can't come to church every night and just shine here and be good. But out there, I'm a different man from in here. Don't you even say he's speaking to you, not to me. Hallelujah. <laughs> so the Lord spoke to me. I've been now, uh, I, I, I say I'm 29 years in the ministry, but it feels like 30 for me. But, you know, being 29 years in the ministry and doing the things that I'm doing and travel the world and, and all the preaching. The Lord spoke to me two years ago and he said to me, stop seeing yourself as, as a, a young person in the Lord. You are a father to the church. That's what he said to me. I said, forget it, Lord, I'm not a father. Because, you know, the language in the church today is father, sons, father, sons. You know, there's all that stuff. And, and he said, you're a father. And I said, Lord, I can't be a father. I travel. I'm preaching around, you know. He said, no. What the church needs is fathers again. Amen. Because the, the world, and especially in Australia, the, the world is growing up with a fatherless generation. And even in America and in our country, the divorces, you know, all the, 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 uh, the um, adultery that's going on, the, the premarital sex and people falling pregnant and having kids and, and these children growing up without daddies. And the church has lost its voice. It's lost its ability to speak the truth. And so the Lord spoke to me and he said, 
Don't see yourself as, as a, a younger person, but you are a father to many people out there, and you'll speak the truth. And that's why I speak the way I speak. I've been speaking this for 30 years, but now, you know, I think people would listen to me now. Because we need to repent and make right with God. You cannot listen. You cannot flirt with the world and have a relationship with Jesus. Because marriage is sacred. I mean, marriage is sacred. When I married my wife, do you remember all of us who stood? I mean, if you got married in a church, you stood before the, the uh, pastor and he had, you had vows. And, and you said stuff like this. Until death do us part. You made promises like for richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. Do you remember making a commitment to your husband like that? Your wife? And when I made a decision, I said to my wife, I said, Shemaine, I'm marrying you because I love you. And I'll never cheat on you again. I'll never look at another woman with lust. I will never, ever, ever want to have anything to do with another woman. I'm, I'm committing myself to you, G, uh, to you, Shemay. Do you remember? And I tell you what, our marriage is wonderful. We are blessed. We are blessed. I'm serious. We are blessed. My wife is, is my very best friend. Our relationship is, is it's getting richer and richer and richer the older we get. We still sit until 2 o'clock, and you can ask my, my children who travel now with us. We still sit and visit until 2 o'clock in the morning. We sit and talk, you know, uh, apart from all the other good things that there is. But th this is what we do. It's, uh, this is my wife. She's my friend. She's my lover. She's my everything. Okay? Uh, the point I'm making, I made a commitment to her. Now I get born again. I'm committed to Jesus. So you see, in our marriage, Shemay knows, and I know that for her, Jesus is number one. For me, Jesus is number one. She's number two in my life. Jesus is number one. But together, <laughs> we don't feel threatened about Jesus being number one because we're both serving him. So we both have, you know, we both committed to Jesus. So there's no competition of Jesus, my wife. We serve him. Now, if I talk about marriage and my commitment to my wife, so I am married to Jesus when I gave my heart to him. And when I gave my life to Jesus, I said, Lord, I'm finished with the world. I'm not going to flirt with the world. I'm not going to look at other women when I'm married to my wife. Therefore, Lord, I'm not going to look at things that is going to break my relationship with you. Because that's the price of commitment. People want to give their hearts to Jesus, but they want to stand with one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. You cannot have both. You cannot be hot. I mean, you cannot be lukewarm. You've got to be either hot or you've got to be cold. Amen. So Peter comes and he says this. He denies Jesus with an oath. He says, I do not know the man. And then the following happens. A third time. The Bible says this, surely, a little later, those, uh, verse 73, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for, watch this, your speech betrays you. I like that one. <laughs> we were sitting in the airplane flying here, and there was a person sitting next to Shemaine, and I don't know, something happened, and... They just, you know, she, the, I don't know what, but Shemaine just turned around and said, Amen. I said, your speech just betrayed you. <laughs> 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 because we learn the lingo, don't we? Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Jesus. Have you noticed when you're in the worldly place and you know, you're just talking to some person, out pops, comes the Amen. Oh, praise God. You know, and they look at what? Your speech betrays you. <laughs> I love that. So she said to Peter, your speech betrays you. Now, look what he does. He began to curse. He began to swear. And he said, I do not know the man. He just started by saying, 
you're wrong in what you're saying about me. Now he curses, swears, and denies Jesus flat out. And this is what happens to most Christians. We get, we get on fire for God and we get excited about Jesus. Then as time goes on and, and the more we get, you know, uh, 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 the more we are in the worldly system and the less we go to church, the less we obey God, the less we're in prayer, we begin to act like Peter did in front of the world. And what I love about this, and I'm finishing with this, but it says the following. When he said that, immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And watch this. So he went out and he wept bitterly. And that is where the true repentance took place. Because when that took place right there, he understood, I denied the Lord in front of everybody. Even though I said I will die for him, I denied him. And when the reality hit him, he fell on his knees. He went separate and he cried out and he said, God, I am so sorry. And we know the Lord forgave him, but that's when his ministry took off. Upon the revelation, he started preaching. He started flowing in the supernatural. Are you with me? There were two sons. The father came to the first son and he said to him, Son, go and work for me in the vineyard. The son said to him, I go, sir. But he did not go. This is in Matthew chapter 28. But as he said to his father, I'm not going to go and work for you. Afterwards, the Bible says he repented and he went. So the father went to the second son and he said to the son, Son, Will you go and work for me in the vineyard? And the son said, yes, yes, I'll go. But he never went. So Jesus asked, which one was obedient to the father, the first or the second? The Pharisees said, the first one. And so tonight, we are sitting here in church. You've all been in, saved many years, I'm sure. But Jesus is asking, will you go and work for me? And a lot of you said, yes, so yeah, sure. And yet, if you go and look at your life, my life, we look at ourselves, have I been working for him? Am I like the first son who said, or the second son who says, yes, I'll do it, sure. Matthew 28, I'm going to go and make disciples, sure. And yet I haven't made disciples. I haven't preached the word. I haven't gotten out there and testified and witnessed for Jesus. Can we all be like this, the first son who repented? And he said, I'm sorry. And then he went. May we all tonight have a revelation of who Jesus is. May we find repentance in our hearts, even though I don't feel I need to repent. But may I say, Lord, I know that I could have been witnessing more for you. I know that I could have been more active in the kingdom for your kingdom's sake, for your church, Lord. But I haven't. I've been that undercover agent hiding away. Lord, touch me and change me tonight. That we can have this building full by Wednesday night. That we can see people come forward and receive salvation. Amen. Amen. That God can begin to do the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. Are you understanding where I'm coming from? Do you remember last night I spoke about the glass and the water being poured in and the dirt coming out? This is what's happening now. The word is being preached. The word is, is working in our hearts. God is stirring us up here. And the moment you and I get busy with the things of God, when I preach the way I do, you don't have to feel down and guilty. You say, hey, brother, hmm, I've been doing that. I'm okay. Preach it. Preach it. Get on it. I don't feel guilty. I don't feel bad. And I don't feel condemned. Because that's the word of today. Oh, they're condemning us. You preach a hard word, brother. Have you ever heard people say that? I hear that every time I go to a church. Oh, you preach a hard word. You preach a hard word. You preach hard I was in another church in, uh, where were we, in, in uh, the, the pastor's wife came to me. She said, I'm baptizing you with a new name. I said, really? She said, yeah, I'm calling you Zorro. <laughs> I said, Zorro, why? She said, because you cut us up. <laughs> you cut us up. I said, I don't want to be called Zorro. Why do I want to? Uh, if I'm preaching a hard word, all I'm doing is reading the scripture. 
So what you're saying is God, Jesus' word is hard, not me. You get what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. Did you receive tonight? Amen. Are we ready for revival? Amen. Not God, start with my pastor, start with my husband, but Lord, start with me. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for the message. Lord, I spoke a lot and I said many things, but you promised and you said you'll give us the keys of the kingdom. And Lord, when we receive these keys, we receive authority. And with this authority, you said what we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. But Lord, so many people have these keys, but they don't have the authority to handle those keys. And so I'm asking you tonight, Lord, that you will speak, minister, um, empower, cause repentance to take place, cause, cause a seriousness in our hearts. To come to you, Lord, that we can get real, Father. And I'm preaching for myself every time, as much as I preach for the church, Lord. Help us to pray. Help us to get real. Help us to be obedient. Help us to serve you, Lord. We don't want to work for the church. We want to work for you, Jesus. So I'm asking you tonight, Father, as I'm about to lay hands on this audience, that... There will be a revelation of Jesus. That we will have this encounter, this understanding of who Jesus is. That we would repent like Peter repented. We will repent also. Because Lord, so many times, even I, we deny Jesus. Lord, we don't want to be like that. We are proud of who we are. We carry that great name, Christianity. Jesus, our Father, Abba Father. I want to ask with every, you're all standing now, but with every head bowed and every eye closed, if if you've never, like Nicodemus, listen to this now, you've been in church all your life, like Nicodemus has been in church all his life, but you've never had that revelation, you've never really given your heart to Jesus. Then tonight, God is asking you to surrender your life to Him. That you would be born again. Jesus said in Matthew chapter uh, 3, verse 6, He said to Nicodemus, He said, Nicodemus, don't marvel, don't be amazed if I told you you must be born again. And here I am standing in a church of people who love God, but don't be amazed that I'm standing here tonight and saying to you, you must be born again. I'm not asking you to go to church. I'm not asking you whether you know Jesus. I'm asking you, are you born again? And if you stand there tonight and you say, Brother Dion, I, I, I don't know where I am. You asked a question earlier tonight and you said, if I die, where will I go? I, I'm, I'm one of those people. I don't know where I'm going if I die. I hope I'm going to go to heaven, but I'm not sure. Tonight... You can have the assurance of your salvation. Tonight you can be born again. Tonight you can surrender your life to Jesus. Tonight he can take you out of the miry clay. Tonight he can step into your life and change your situation that you're in. Just surrender to him. Just open up to him tonight. If anybody's standing here with your eyes closed, you say, Dion, would you pray for me? Please, I want to make right with Jesus tonight. I want to give my heart to Jesus. If that is you, would you raise your hand right now and I can pray with you. If you say, please pray for me. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to give my life to Jesus. If that is you, quickly slip your hand up, wave your hand at me and I can pray. Thank you. I see a hand over there. Is there any other hands going up? If you've raised your hand, I can't see everywhere, but if you have raised your hand, won't you quickly please come and stand up front here by me? I would love to pray with you. If you raise your hand, please come on down here and I can pray with you. Don't be shy. Please come on down. Please come on down. Ah, here's another one. Come on, somebody else raise their hand. Audience, help me. Do you remember what I taught you last night? Would you quickly turn around and evangelize? I want you all to evangelize. Come on, ask your neighbor, are you sure you are right with Jesus tonight? Come on, evangelize. 
I can go to four people now. I see four people standing here. Your life is not right with Jesus. Come on. We want to help you come to Jesus tonight. Just evangelize. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Now look at me. If you got offended because somebody came and asked you if you're right, then you're not right with Jesus. I'll say it again. If you got mad because somebody asked you, are you right with and you got angry, that, that you're not right with Jesus. Because anybody who died in Christ cannot take offense. So you cannot be offended. If you got offended, repent, come forward. Let Jesus save you tonight. Is there anybody else who would like to give their heart to Jesus? Oh, and by the way, we're not asking you to join this church. It's not what we're doing. We're asking you to make right with Jesus. Death is one breath away. If you come from my country where we are, your life is not even worth a cell phone. They kill you just like that. Come. God bless you. Come on, young man. We're so proud of you. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. But I, I, I tell you what, though. I, I cannot let this go now because I know there's two or three people. I know where you are. I can go to you, touch you right now, but I'm not allowed to because salvation is a free will choice. You make a choice. I cannot force this on you. But the fact of the matter is, if you did die, think about this. If you had to die without knowing Jesus and you dropped into hell, because that's what happens. You go down to hell immediately. You'll be burning in a lake of fire forever. And these words, listen to me, these words will be in your mind. You will say, why did I not listen to that man? And why did I not give my heart to Jesus? And then it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. So swallow your pride, swallow your stubbornness, and make right with Jesus. Because He loves you. He loves you. Father, I bind every demonic spirit in this room right now. I bind every lying spirit, every blinding spirit, and every deaf spirit. And by the power of God, give them to me. I break it in Jesus' name. You let those people go right now. You will not hold any person captive. Who needs to be born again in Jesus' name. You take your hands off of them right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now I'm going to count to three and I'll let this thing go. But if your heart is going, gung, 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 that's you. You need to be up here. God is standing and He's calling you right now. Intercessors, pray in tongues. Those of you who can pray in tongues, let's, let's pray for the soul to come in tonight. Please, please listen to me. Just come forward. It'll be the best decision you've ever made in your life. You give your life to Jesus. I'm going to count to three and then, then we go on. One. Come on down. Come on down, friend. Come on down. He's waiting for you. Come on down. Two. Come on down. We're not criticizing, we're not judging, we're just waiting expectantly for you to give your life to Jesus tonight. This is my last call. My last call. Anybody else? Young lady, you know who you are. Shall I say, young ladies, you know who you are. Come on down. Come on down. Make right with Jesus. Going once. Going twice. Praise the Lord. There's another one. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Just come on down. Anybody else? I know you don't like me right now, but you'll thank me afterwards. I promise you that. Last call. Anybody? Anybody else? 
You guys up front, would you come a little bit closer to me, please? God bless you. How many of you are glad for these people making a decision tonight? Oh, isn't that wonderful? What's your name, young man? What's your name? Stevie. Stevie? How old are you? The devil's tried to kill you three times, you know that? Is that true? Yeah, and you tried to take your life as well once. Is that true? And you know that if you did that, where would you have ended up? Yeah. So the decision you're making tonight is quite a good decision. Do you agree? To give your life to Jesus? Think about that, of course. If you had to take your life or if somebody killed you, what would happen? You would end up in hell and you would never get out of hell. So just the fact that you're standing here tonight, you're saying, I want to give my heart to Jesus. That's a good decision. God wants to heal you tonight and deliver you, Stevie. I wish I was 23, your age, when I gave my heart. I wasn't. I was older than you. But I want to tell you that God has a, has a plan for your life. And I know, I know you don't understand it, but God really does. You don't see that now, but I see you in the future standing on the front stage talking to people what, about your life that has been changed. I know it sounds hard to believe, but that's what you're going to be doing for Him. You see, once, once you've touched God, you'll never be the same again. Him? Do you want to give your heart to Jesus? Not because somebody told you to, because you want to. Yeah, good. You wonderful people in front, would you close your eyes and would you pray after me? Church, would you stretch your hands out and pray with them? Can I ask you, but you must confess this with your mouth, okay? You have to pray loud after me. Would you say, Heavenly Father, please forgive me. Forgive all, my all my sins in Jesus name, in Jesus name. I, believe I believe the blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus washes me, washes me cleanses, me cleanses me of all my sins, all my sins. I have no more sin, I have no more sin as I stand here now say it I have no more sin I have no more I've sin. been forgiven I've been forgiven I believe, I believe and confess that Jesus, Christ that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is the Son of that God, God raised Jesus, and by grace, Jesus from, the dead. from the dead. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, and I ask you, Lord Jesus come, and live in my heart. come and live in my heart. I receive you right now, I receive you right as, now. My God, as my God, God my Savior, and my very best friend. And my very best friend. If, I should die tonight, if I should die tonight, I will not go to hell. I will, not go to hell. I will go to heaven. Because I'm born again. Because I'm born again. I am saved. I'm and, saved. My and my name is written, is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, I will serve you. Father, I will serve with all of my heart, with all, all of my soul, all and all of my being. And all of my being. Tonight, Tonight, I'm a different person. I'm a different person. In Jesus' name. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God a clap offering. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What is your name? Maggie. Maggie. How old are you, Maggie? 13. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you know what's going to happen to you, Maggie? The Lord just spoke to me and He said, He's giving you a voice. He's giving you a voice. You're going you're gonna to be singing but talking. I hear you're going to be sharing your testimony. Do you know what? When you're older, Maggie... You're gonna be um, you're gonna be standing in lady conferences and speaking to ladies. Yeah. I believe that with all my heart. God's gonna use you powerfully. In actual fact, while you are wiping those tears away, I see the Lord has put a two-edged sword in your mouth. The two-edged sword means you're gonna God is gonna speak to you and you're gonna speak God's word. That's the two-edged sword. God says you don't have to be afraid of those people who have spoken about you. Many times you feel disappointed and let down. You thought my friends were my friends, but then they've spoken behind your back and they've hurt you. The Lord says, don't worry, I'm taking care of them. I'm taking care. You are like the apple of His eye. He, he's holding you in the palm of His hand. Do you receive what I'm saying? Amen.
You're going to be a voice. You're going to be a voice for Jesus. Amen. Oh, I'm so happy. Amen. Ma'am, you've been struggling with a sickness in your body. It's been quite a long time. Nine years. Would you like to be healed tonight from that thing? For nine years. You've made right with God. You're a daughter of God. A child of God. How did I know you've been struggling with this? God showed me that. Do you have pain? Do you have pain in your body? Where? Stage four liver cancer. I believe God's going to heal you. Hallelujah. I really believe. You. So would you all stretch your hands out? What's your name? Susie. Father, we pray for Sister Susie, Lord. And the devil who's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, tonight he will not be able to do that. Father, we thank you for the anointing that will destroy the yoke of bondage. By the power of God given to me, like Jesus cursed the fig tree, so I curse this stage for cancer in her body right now. And I command you, saying, die! in her now in Jesus name. you die within her right now in Jesus name. to the very roots wherever the cancer has spread out in her body Lord throughout her whole body Lord we curse it that it will shrivel up and die within her right now in Jesus name and father we ask you that you'll give her a new liver we lose from heaven new body parts father new blood cells father in the name of jesus that she will be healed and not die but she will live so that she too can be a witness to the world about jesus that's it that's it that's it heal her now lord take away all pain discomfort father god give her a new liver let the doctors be amazed. Let the people stand back and say, what happened? And she will say, Jesus. We lose this miracle. Nine years she's been struggling. Lord. But tonight is the turning point in her life. In Jesus' name. Do you believe that? Come on, you're going to go to the doctor, test it. You're going to come bring us the good report. Amen. How many of you believe that with me? We're going to take names. Do you want to write down the names? Are we going to take them back? Anybody new here? Okay. You all belong to this church? Belong to this church? You belong here? All belong here? Okay. Well, just stay here then. How many of you want to have that greater revelation of Jesus? Come on down. Come on down. Pastor Cindy, would you help me tonight, please? And uh, Pastor Rick, would you help me tonight? Pastor Stephen, I want you to help me as well. I'm going to ask Pastor Cindy. I'm going to ask Pastor Rick. I'm going to ask my son Stephen. They're going to minister with me tonight. Is that okay with everybody? All we're going to ask is, Lord, a greater revelation. I want a revelation. Like Peter had a revelation, I want a revelation. If you are sick in your body, just let us know. We will pray with you, obviously. If you need a healing, that's no problem. But for me tonight, it's that inner healing. It is that deeper thing that I may know Him more. Amen. Can I have a catch, obviously, with every pastor? So everybody close your eyes and say this with me. Say, Father God, again I ask you to open up my eyes. I want to see you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord, more than ever before. In Jesus' name. I don't just want to sit in church. I want to be active for your kingdom. Let me receive a greater compassion than I've ever had before. In Jesus' name. I want to see through your eyes. I want to hear through your ears. I want to touch through your hands. In the name of Jesus. Use me, Father. I make myself available for your use. In Jesus' name. If you agree, just begin to pray. 
And thank you, pastors. Go ahead and let's minister to the folk.
some bread A fire on my own to never burn out A fire on my own to never burn out A fire on my own to never burn out Cause I am your house of bread A fire on my own to never burn out A fire on my own to never burn out a fire on my own to never burn out as I am your house of bread. A fire on my own to never burn out. A fire on my own to never burn out. A fire on my own to never burn out as I am your house of prayer. Lord. I am your house, yeah. Lord, I am your house of prayer. Yes, I am your house of prayer. Oh, Lord, I am your house. I am your house of prayer. I am your house of prayer. Yes, I am your house of prayer. Oh, a fire on my own to never burn out. The fire on my own to never burn out. The fire on my own to never burn out. Cause I am your house of prayer. The fire on my own to never burn out. The fire on my own to never burn out. The fire on my own to never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer The fire on my own to never burn out The fire on my own to never burn out The fire on my own to never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer The fire on my own to The fire on my altar Cause I am your house of prayer yeah. The fire on my altar Never burn out The fire on my altar Never burn out The fire on my altar Will never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer Oh, the fire on my altar Will never burn out will never burn out the fire on my altar will never burn out cause I am your house of prayer Lord I am your house yeah yes I am your house of prayer yes I am your house of prayer oh Lord I am your house Yes, I am your house of prayer. Oh, Lord, I am your house. Yes, I am your house of prayer. Yes, I am your house of prayer. Oh, Lord, I am your house. Yes, I am your house of prayer. My altar will never burn out. Fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. I am your house of prayer. The fire on my altar will never burn out. Fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. I am your house of Fire on my altar will never burn out. The 
Fire on my altar will never burn out Fire on my altar will never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out As I am your house of prayer Oh, the fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out as I am your house of prayer Fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer Hey, the fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer Yes, I am your house of prayer Lord, I am your house of prayer Lord, I am your house of prayer I am your house of prayer Lord, I am your house of prayer I am a house of prayer Lord, 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 I am a house of prayer I am a house of prayer Lord, I am your house I am your house of prayer I am your house of prayer Lord, I am your house I am your house of prayer I am your house of prayer Oh, the fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out the fire on my altar will never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out the fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer, Lord The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out the fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar I said the fire on my altar The fire on my altar will never burn out Cause I am a house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out the fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never
the burnout. I am a house of prayer, the fire on my altar, the fire on my altar, the fire on my altar will never burn out. I am a house of prayer. Oh, I am a house of prayer. I am a house of prayer. I am a house of prayer. I am your house of prayer. I am your house of prayer. Oh Lord, I am your house. I am your house of prayer. I am your house of prayer. Lord, I am your house. I am your house of prayer. Your house of prayer. Oh Lord, I am your house. Yeah, I am your house of prayer. Your house of prayer. The fire on my altar will never burn out. Fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. I am your house of prayer. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. Cause I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out Cause I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out the fire on my altar will never burn out. I am your house of prayer. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. I am your house of prayer. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out the fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer the fire on my altar there's a fire on my altar to never burn out there's a fire on my altar to never burn out there's a fire on my altar to never burn out as I am your house of prayer Yes, I am your house of prayer. 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 Yes, I am your house of prayer. 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 Yes, I am your house of prayer. I am your house of prayer. I am your house of prayer. Lord, I am your house of prayer. I am your house of prayer. Lord, I am your house of prayer. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. I am your house of prayer. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. The fire on my altar will never burn out. 
I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out Fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out The fire on my altar will never burn out I am your house of prayer I am your house I am your house of prayer Lord I am your house I am your house of prayer Oh I am your house I am your house of rain Oh I am your house I am your house of rain
Dion, Evangelist Dion, speak tonight. I just seen people's hearts shifted. Just seen them shifted. Their mindsets were beginning to shift. Can we just give him a hand clap? Is there handing out communion? We want to receive an offering. How many tomorrow night will bring somebody? Amen. Not someone that's been churched, but just literally go out in the street and say, hey, we got this crazy guy from South Africa. Why don't you come see him? How many will do that? Can I see some hands? That you'll just go out and just say, hey, bring them in. Amen? God wants to change this region. He's going to change this region. That's why this church is here. Amen? How many is ready to receive? I mean, how many is ready to sow a seed? Amen? I want to read out of 2 Corinthians tonight to receive an offering. You can be seated. And I know this church is a given church because I know the apostles and I, the apostle and pastor Cindy and I know what they teach here and I know what they preach here. You're a given people. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, it says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. So tonight, I just want you to Take time, not just pull out something, but just take time and say, Lord, what would you have me to give into this offering? What kind of seed you would have me to sow tonight into this ground? And the word says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. That's the word of God. So how much do you want to receive? It's according to how you give. So don't get jealous at me if I when I get my jet plane. Amen. It's because I sold for it. Amen. Amen. Come on, amen. amen. Glory. That's how it works. It's God's law. It's set in motion. He cannot lie. Amen. It's like the law in the natural. The laws in the natural is if you're doing 70 and a 50, guess what? And you get pulled over, you get caught, you get pulled over. It's a law. How many know there's a law in the spiritual realm? Amen. Of, of giving and receiving. All right, I don't have to go too far because I know Apostle, he really hammers, he teaches on this. But he said, who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So, well, Brother Rick, I've been sowing, I ain't been receiving. Just keep sowing, I guarantee you, it's going to come back to you. Amen. But here, here's the key. So let each one give as he purpose in his heart. So we're not twisting anybody's arm tonight to give anything. Whatever you purposed in your heart, whatever God's telling you to give, you give. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Not grudgingly or of a necessity, necessity, for God loves a what? Cheerful giver. So God loves a cheerful giver. 
So if you're giving a seed and you're mad, well, that church is wanting my money. And you know what? You might as well just keep it. I'll be honest with you. Amen. And so what I want us to do tonight, I want you to say, Lord, what would you have me to give into this offering? Put a name on your seed. What do you believe in God for? Amen? You want to do that? Can we have a little music? Wonder. So just ask yourself. Ask yourself. Lord, what would you have me to give? And bring it up. Come on. Let me hear you sing best. Come on, everybody. Let me hear you sing best. Let me hear you come on and sing. I hear you sing best. Bless. 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 I'm blessed. Bless. Like a light in a dark land, uh, since thou were placed in my heart. Come on, let's stand. Oh, the let's Lord's stand. Command, uh, he set me up on nations, cast thine enemies away. It's rising up within you, uh, so let me hear you say, We're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the field, we're blessed Bless. when we come and when we go. We cast down every stronghold. In poverty must cease For the devil is defeated We are blessed Now let me hear you sing best Come on everybody Yeah, let me hear you sing best I can't hear you Lift your voice and sing best One more time sing best Turn it around It's gonna work in your favor Believe it Late in the midnight hour God's gonna turn it around And around And around And around Yeah Late in the midnight hour God's gonna turn it around It's gonna work in your favor Believe it Late in the midnight hour Gonna turn it around and around and around and around. Now let me hear you sing best. Lift your voice and sing best. Come on, everybody, let me hear you sing best. Hey, come on, we gonna declare it. I'm blessed. Come on, sing, y'all. We declaring it. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Because I tithe and so I'm blessed. Hey, hey. I know that I'm blessed. Hallelujah. Thank God I'm blessed. We're gonna sing this one more time. Yeah, yeah. Late in the midnight hour, God's gonna turn it around. It's gonna work in your favor. Believe it. Late in the midnight hour. God's gonna turn it around. It's gonna work in your favor. Yeah, y'all got it. Come on, you got it. I see y'all turning around. Late in the midnight hour, God's gonna, gonna turn, turn it, it around. around and around and around and around. Now let me hear you shout, blessed. Yeah, come on, sing, blessed. Bless. Lift your voice one more time, sing out, blessed. Bless. Bless. Hey, I'm blessed. Blessed. Hallelujah. How many is blessed in this place tonight? Come on. How many is blessed up in I'm here tonight? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed when I'm going. I'm blessed when I'm coming. I'm blessed, blessed. in the field. I'm blessed. your neighbor beside you and say hey are you blessed come on let's say it one more time I'm blessed I'm blessed <laughs> yeah I'm blessed hey declare 
word tonight I'm blessed I'm blessed Yes I am I'm blessed I'm blessed I'm blessed <laughs> Say Lord I thank you that I'm blessed tonight I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out Come on, say I'm blessed coming in and I'm, I'm blessed, blessed going when I'm out. Coming. I'm blessed when I'm going. I'm blessed in the city. I'm blessed in the field. <laughs> my God. I'm blessed in my house. I'm blessed in my house. I'm blessed in my car. I'm blessed in my car. <laughs> I'm blessed on my job. I'm blessed on my job. Everything I touch, everything I put my hands to, yeah, yeah. My God said, my God said, my God said, my God said, I am there. Give him a hand clap if you believe it. Come on, give him a hand clap. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me and my family. Has everybody had a chance to give? How many is believing for a harvest? Hallelujah. I believe in 2020 we're going to get a bumper harvest. Hey, hey glory. Oh, we got some folk in here believe that. I'm going to believe with them. Amen. Say 2020 will be a different year going to be the best year. Yes. Touch your name. Say, it's going to be the best year you've ever seen. It's going to be the best year you've ever seen. Hallelujah. I want Sheraton to play, pray over this offer, this offering tonight. Can you do that, brother? We can hold that bucket, whoever. Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you for the tithes and offerings on tonight, Lord God. We lift them up in honor of you, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, that we sow into good ground in this house, Father God. We know that every seed that is sown into this house shall reap a harvest, Lord God. I thank you that all our bills are paid, all our debts are retired. Father God, we live in favor, we live in blessings, we live in your grace, Lord God. Everywhere we go, Father God, we receive from what we have sown, Lord God. We thank you that our... Uh, <clears throat> Our children are blessed. Our parents are blessed. Our brothers and sisters are blessed, Lord God. Everybody we come in contact with will, will be blessed. And so we thank you for every seed sown from a cheerful heart, Father God, knowing and trusting and relying and depending on you that you are the source of life, Lord God. And we trust your system. We trust your kingdom. We depend on it and we rely on it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I mean, it's ready to do communion. I'm going to do the first part, and I'm going to let Sheridan, Brother Sheridan, do the second. You got your. I may know this is a serious thing. Jesus paid a debt that we couldn't pay. 1 Corinthians 11 24. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body. This is Jesus speaking. Which is broken for you. For you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread. Hold it up. Father, we thank you. That your body was broken for me. That when they drove them nails into your hand, Lord, and they hit you in the back with the whip, 39 stripes, Lord, you were thinking of your church. I thank you, Father, for your body. Thank you for what you did at the cross for me. Let's see.
Amen. Verse 25 says, 1 Corinthians verse 11, 25 says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> so, we do this in remembrance of you, Lord God. We thank you that the blood of Jesus still speaks. We thank you that the blood of Jesus still covers us. It keeps us. It protects us. We thank you, Father God, that the blood of Jesus heals and delivers and set free, Lord God. Your blood is still alive this day, Lord God. And we receive of your blood in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Cindy. Thank you. We love you. Amen. God is good. Come on, praise Jesus. God is good. Amen. Wow. It's just amazing, Pastor Hoffman. We just love you. God bless you and your family, Stephen, you know, Bianca, Pastor Sherman. We just, we love y'all. And then Pastor Rick, Evangelist Rick Ross, Evangelist Sherry, just as he is you as well. We just bless you tomorrow. I know you're not going to be with us, but we love you. Come on, give it up for Evangelist Rick Ross and Sherry. We love them. You know, they call him here Uncle Rick. And we just love him. And we're just going to get ourselves ready because we're going to be headed out to South Africa. We're just excited. So I just tell you, bring someone tomorrow. It's going to be fire tomorrow even more fire make a difference in somebody's life amen get out of the church walls not someone that's a christian let's get somebody that don't know jesus amen come on the lord's gonna put one in front of you maybe several amen come on hold your hands up tonight father god in the name of jesus lord we bless you foremost father god and we just thank you for tonight we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, for the man of God that spoke today, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for refilling him up, Lord. And as he rests and his family rests tonight, Father God, that they wake up with full strength tomorrow, Lord, in Jesus' name, ready to preach the fire again. Now, Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for your rest upon him and his family. Father God, I thank you, everyone that joined us tonight. I believe they received. I believe those that are joining us online received. I thank you, Father God, that we're leaving this place, not challenged, but changed. We will never, 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 never be back what we used to be. From this day forward, I decree and declare, we will glorify your name. We will look up high and we will say, Jesus changed my life. Amen. Come on, make sure you come tomorrow. Come, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here. So just know that we're excited for you. We'll see you tomorrow. Amen. Go to the cafe. We love you all. God bless you.